Hello, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me now. Excellent. First, everybody's favorite part, some audience participation, but don't worry, I'm not going to ask you anything bad. Um, first of all, how many of you are game developers that do your own marketing? How many of you are game developers that do no marketing? Yes. How many of you are game developers that have hired somebody else to do your marketing? Very few of you. You should do that, it's very handy. That's not just for people like me, I promise. <laughs> All right, so I think that now we've gone past that audience participation part, we can totally begin. To start off, who the hell am I and why am I doing this talk? Also, I just generally appreciate there are this many of you here that are interested in sales funnels, because I realize that on the list of talks, it probably doesn't sound as exciting as the other ones, so good job. <laughs> Um, my name is Haley Uris. I am the marketing manager at Fail Bitter Games, and I have far too many degrees, but they're usually very helpful for what I do. I actually started as a graphic designer, so I'm very much into the creative side of marketing, um, but I've been working specifically in indie games marketing for about five or six years now. You may have heard of our games at Fail Bitter Games, um, such as Fall in London, Sunless Sea, and Sunless Skies. And by the way, you should totally wishlist some of the skies on Steam, just saying it would be very helpful. <laughs> I also dressed for this part today, so I hope you appreciate that. Um, I believe this is the first marketing talk for AdventureX, so I appreciate, like I said, that you're all here. Um, it's very exciting as well for me. Um, when I ask indies, you know, what do you want to know about marketing or what questions do you have? A lot of people just say, where do I start? Um, and I think that sales funnels, as dry as they sound, are a really useful and easy way to plot out the marketing activities that you should do for your game. But what the hell is a sales funnel? Basically, a sales funnel is when, you know, the path that a player takes from hearing about your game to buying your game, which hopefully is your end goal. <laughs> there are a few different ways that they can be constructed, but for the purpose of this talk, we'll be going over five different areas. So awareness, interest, um, decision, action, and retention. And that last one is kind of a bonus one, which I'll go to at the end. The goal is for your players to travel down each level of the funnel until they finally buy your game. But why is this important? For starters, um, it can help you to discover where you have gaps in your marketing, weaknesses, or any bottlenecks. <coughs> It can help you make more creative and efficient marketing, I'd say, too, which is obviously great because I'm sure you'd all rather get back to the actual game development side of things. We all know that there's a bazillion games that come out on Steam and mobile every day, so it's always good to make it easier for people to be able to discover you. And finally, it helps you to create a happier and more loyal player base, so hopefully when you go on to create your next game, they want to come with you as a community. But before I jump into the specifics of, you know, what marketing activities are at each level of the funnel, I'm going to try to display the logic behind it. So imagine this, you're an indie dev, you have a narrative based adventure game, and you know who your target audience is, and you'd like to just, you know, start talking about your game. So you have your player, and her mother has already told her to be wary of strangers. Um, she's just going to, you know, go about her business. She's got grandmothers to see, things to do. She's going to follow the path to her destination. <laughs> you can't just pop out of the woods and expect her to want to buy your game. You're lacking two key components, first of which is trust, because obviously her mom already told her not to talk to strangers. And the second is uh, specifically interest, because obviously she doesn't know anything about your game. She's got things to do already, so she's not just going to stop and linger for just anything. And if you think I'm going to tell you to be more big bad wolf, I'm not. <laughs> His end game was bad too. Uh, mismanaging player expectations is like a cardinal marketing sin, so don't do that. Um, if we paraded around some of the skies looking like dead space, I think that a lot of people would be very upset at launch <laughs> when they realize just how much reading they have to do. So don't do that. But what should you do? <laughs> Build up the top of your funnel. Place more opportunities for people to see and get to know you. Things like ads, news articles, funny gifts, memes, etc., to attract people's attention. And since this is the top of the funnel, it's the widest part. 
So it's going to be a place where you spend a lot of time in marketing. But I would say one of the easiest mistakes with these sort of sales funnel things is to create a top-heavy funnel. And it's no surprise people would actually accidentally do this if they've not done marketing before. <coughs> it's often the type of marketing people are most familiar with, so things like ads, landing pages, social media announcements, launch trailers, PR, etc. Um, pretty much anything that you see from big companies especially. And sure, you can dress up your game nicely, and you can put it everywhere where players are going to see it, but it's still going to lack that hook or that USP to really get them interested in, to engage, and become you know, a potential customer. These days, it's especially good to have strongly focused and consistent messaging throughout your entire marketing, a precise brand and platform that showcases your game's unique selling points, and a concise voice that runs throughout all of your messaging. And the next level of the funnel, interest, is all about that. It's about creating catered content specifically to engage your audience further. These are things like development blogs or let's plays that let people who want to see more investigate your game further. Um, and you can be as creative with these as you'd like. And obviously, you know, these do take time. But if you want people to really get invested in and sit within your game, they're very important. Delivering these pieces allow you to really dig deep and showcase to the hooks of your game. Um, while building up that trust. But it's important to still think of this as a fairly wide section of that funnel. Um, if you focus too much or too narrowly on this section, then your efforts you know, may only attract a small amount of very interested people. Um, and why only attract a few when you could attract many? Chances are your game have a variety of different audience segments. Um, so it's good to kind of create content for each of these different segments. In Sunless Skies, for example, we have some people that are all about the RPG and the narrative aspect. And then we have other people that are like obsessed with the stats and flying around and doing combat and stuff like that. So when we create marketing pieces, we try to cover all those different types of people that are going to play our game. So make sure you're hopefully doing that for yours as well. And then next we have decision. And this is all about incentivizing players over that buyer's decision ledge towards the end and pushing them into the action you want in a nice way. This is where you can offer things like a free beta or demo at a show, you know, let them try it on, see how it feels. Um, this is where you can also offer things like launch discounts and bundles. It's really anything that is going to make that decision easier for them. And just to reiterate, I'm not telling you to plot out your marketing plan like a villain, I swear. I mean, it would be fun. But we all know that no matter how successful, you know, villains plans are at the beginning, there's something that will undo them at the end. And these days, I think everybody can agree, people you know, generally distrust marketing. Um, so it's really good to try to stay transparent, honest, and conscientious, because they will find you and call you out on it if you aren't. <laughs> but like most fairy tales, um, it's really important to learn about lessons from them. So don't focus on the ends of your funnel and lapse in the middle. This can be really tempting if your game development delays. Um, and pulls your attention away from marketing. But if you stay consistent, or if you don't stay consistent and time goes by, you're gonna lose and deplete that trust and interest that you've already built up. And that's one of the hardest things to try to you know, claw back your way from after you've already built it up. Don't create unnecessary friction for people to find your game. Check your website and any other place where you know, you're talking about your game and just make sure it's ungodly, and I mean really ungodly obvious, how people can buy your game. Just assume everybody's an idiot. It's much better and easier to do your marketing that way. <laughs> um, and also that includes things like, you know, if you have a sequel to your game and you have other episodes, just make it very clear, you know, what you have to offer and how people can get there. And don't rely purely on traditional marketing. Depending on the type of game you have, thinking creatively about the types of marketing you can do um, can save you money, but also be even more effective than traditional routes. You may have heard recently that we released a pen and paper RPG called Skyfarer, so that was an example of something more creative on our end. It does dual duty in the fact that obviously our own community is really excited because they get something cool for free, and it's something that's you know mildly within their interest subjects besides games. Um, but also it hopefully is going to attract us a new, slightly adjacent audience into Sunless Skies um, in a way that kind of onboards them to our world building and our messaging. So instead of you know, doing your marketing like a villain, make sure you're tending to players at each stage during this funnel. 
be more fairy godmother. Be intuitive about their needs and try to solve their problems. Do what you can to make their path smoother. Be more hero. Slay their enemies. Stay true to yourself and your values. Okay, so now that I've gone through the logic of kind of why sales funnels are important, um, we can see how these activities align together to convince somebody to buy your game. So this could be entirely different based on your game or what you want to do marketing-wise. It could also vary depending on the genre you have, um, especially if you have like a live game versus a single player, you know, story narrative game. But I think that it hopefully illustrates how all of these different marketing activities eventually lead somebody to buy, subscribe, purchase, or wishlist your game. This methodology is also great if you're at the beginning and you want to analyze competitors' marketing. There's lots to learn from where they're succeeding and where they may have weaknesses where you can kind of top them on that. It's not necessarily that you also have to do all of these activities. It's just finding out which ones are the right way for you to lead somebody down this path. And a sales funnel doesn't have to be rigid either. It's just a way for you to really uh, investigate where you may have weaknesses already. So no matter what stage of development you're in, you should always be thinking, you know, what's my objective and how do I get people there? To illustrate that a bit, um, if you're in your announcement phase, your goal is probably to get people to sign up like to your community. So that could be something like an old school mailing list, but I think those are still generally useful these days for the record. Um, it could be joining a Discord or following you on social media, anything that's about like community building. Um, and so you'd base all of your activities around that to try to move them into doing that. And I think it's very important to not just think, okay, yay, I'm gonna announce my game, I'm gonna put out a trailer, but have no objective or call to action in mind for my player, because then you're going to miss out on building up that community ahead of launch, and these days, I think we can all agree it's really important to have that sort of support system um, in case you maybe weren't able to spread that awareness or top-level function wide enough to get the amount of players that you need. Whereas if you have an early access title, your goal probably focused around wish lists and pre-orders, um, so in order to incentivize people to make that step, you'll want to frame your activities around showing the game <laughs> off in action. So things like let's plays, uh, live streams, and a host of other ways any players can get involved early is always a good idea. Launch is obviously the most traditional example. That's where obviously you're going to want people to buy your game. Uh, it's also one that spans the most amount of time. So I think it's really important to make sure that is the one that you know all your bases are covered on. Focus on the jazziest bit that make your game unique. Show that you engage with your community and that you're really invested in it. Um, and make sure there are enough trigger points towards the end of your funnel to make that purchasing decision really easy for them. So, I probably didn't show you that long enough. Uh, and then of course, because this is marketing, there's a variety of different methodologies around that. Uh, some people prefer to think of it as more of a loop. So. Uh, it's all about you know, creating a space where you can create a loyalty loop and how to consistently please your consumers or your community in order to continue to buy your game or you know, to be involved in the games that you make. Also, um, as we've shifted into the information age, obviously that's changed kind of the, the path of marketing in general. Previously, a lot of the funnel activities um, were solely push marketing, and that means that it's content that businesses push out directly onto people, um, like advertisements, direct marketing, and sponsorships, things like that. Um, but as we've discussed earlier, people now don't really trust that kind of information, uh, especially if it's offered from the company directly, um, because that's not always seen as trustworthy. So instead, people want to find and kind of research their own information that's created from outside the business. And I think that's why things like game reviews are still really important. Um, and that doesn't matter you know, whether it's coming from players or critics or YouTubers or you know, just word of mouth through friends. It's still really vital for people to be able to go out and look up information about your game that you haven't made. Um, and that's called pull marketing. So make sure you kind of set up a balance between these two different types. Aha, but you said we'd be talking about five sections. You are correct. I'm sure all of you were thinking, but no, we haven't talked about retention. Um, indeed, retention is not usually included uh, in sales funnels, but that's because a lot of these are used for boring things like lead generation um, or more like tangible physical products. But even if you don't have a live game, I think it's really important to consider your kind of personal studio goals. Uh, presumably, you're not just out to make one game and then you know pack up and go home. 
So even if you have um, you know, something that isn't a live game, it's important to consider what you can do to strengthen that uh, loyalty loop that we discussed. And marketing doesn't stop when your game's been released. I know you're probably like, damn it, thought I'd be through. Um, keeping your communication and information clear even after you've launched is absolutely vital to retaining those players that you know, you've earned that trust and that interest from. And no marketing should ever be done without an objective in mind. If I have to come find you and tell you that when you're about to do marketing, I will, just tell me. All right, so that brings us towards the end. Um, you can start thinking about questions now because I purposely left this short because A, I thought somebody would go over and B, because I thought people might have questions about marketing. I could be wrong. Um, but in the meantime, I'll kind of summarize what I've talked about here. So first of all, consider the path that your players take from start to finish. Um, you know, use this to create your marketing activities, but always have a firm objective in mind. Balance your marketing activities across different segments of your funnel. Don't expect somebody to just hear about your game once and then go out and immediately buy it. Um, you really need to create ways that people can further engage with you and I, you need to earn their trust and hopefully interest them as well. Use both push and pull techniques. Um, people don't trust most types of marketing, so it's up to you to make sure that your community are encouraged to leave reviews um, and to engage with other influencers and press people that would hopefully also review your game as well. Um, and of course, there's other ways to make people have that opportunity to try out your game, so that whether that's like alphas or betas, trying it out at events, um, or even you know if they can watch a Let's Play somewhere online, those are all good things. Continuously adapt your funnel uh, towards your end goal. So marketing is always in flux and should always be in flux, to be honest. And so should your uh, you know marketing activities around that. We all know that you know game de development also changes as well, so it's totally fine to adapt your marketing plan if things change in that regard. And never stop marketing. I'm sorry, but just because you finished and launched your game doesn't mean that you're done marketing. There's still plenty to do there. So, does anybody have any questions? Anybody? You. Uh, what, what advantages or disadvantages would you say uh, there are for having someone in-house doing marketing versus someone external? Obviously, having somebody in-house might in seem like a lot financially. But I think in-house um, certainly allows somebody to really get to know the inner workings of your game. Certainly at Failbetter, we actually have two in-house marketers, which I think is quite rare for indie games. But considering Fall in London has been around for eight or nine years and has you know incredible amounts of deep lore knowledge and things like that, it means that having two people in-house constantly focusing on your game allows us to adapt really quickly to things if, if opportunities come up, because we can spot those because we know oh, we did this last year, let's pivot and do this instead. Um, if you work with somebody out, you know, um, from an agency or something like that, they might be able to come up with ideas that you haven't even thought about because they've not been in-house, so that there's kind of an added benefit of that. Um, but they're probably only going to be with you for a short time. So if you wanted to hire somebody like, I don't know, six or eight months ahead of your launch to launch, um, they're going to be only focused on that, and you're going to be missing somebody to you know, know the inner workings of your community, which certainly for us is a huge part of our marketing. Um, because I would say almost 50% of what I do is sell games that, you know, we've already pushed out and constantly engage with our community in order to strengthen prospects for our upcoming games. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank cool. You. Anybody else? Yeah? Uh, Albert asks, are there any specific points in marketing where it's most important to get an ex external expert, even if you're doing most of it yourself? Hmm. I'm sure there are, especially if you were trying to do something that is far out of the scope of what you've done previously, like if it's not your expertise in-house. Um, obviously, um, one of the major things that people usually do outsource for is for things like um, press lists, especially if you're a first-time developer and you haven't built that up yourself. Um, it's obviously really easy to work with either agencies or individuals that already have their press list set up for you, um, and that can be a really easy way to just jump in really quickly. But I'm sure there's other um, but very specific examples of why you'd work with somebody out, house, uh, out of house to get uh, more knowledge that maybe you don't have internally. 
Any other questions? Yep. Um, you mentioned uh, like left players as being part of uh, like your American strategy, um, and it's obvious that like the, they're really important to all sort of promotion these days. But lots of like games that we developed here um, are linear content, um, so essentially left players work as a spoiler. So is there, is there a way to engage that type of marketing without like spoiling your game for, for the consumers? I uh, definitely know that is a key thought for a lot of people here. I would say kind of two things. One, um, I think sometimes in, depending on your game and, and how closely that's kind of held to your chest, uh, you could seek out very specific, uh, you know, like top level streamers or YouTubers that you think would be a perfect fit for your game and maybe don't give out, you know, your key to everybody to stream, but just focus on them at like a key launch or pre-launch moment so that you can still you know, uh, increase your audience and awareness spread, but maybe not saturate everybody. Um, and the other thing that I would recommend if you can do is maybe um, work, you know, well in advance of launch or just before launch um, on a small slice of the game that you could give out to influencers. That way you're not, you know, ruining the whole thing. Theoretically, it varies opinions on whether or not that ruins sales. Um, but at least that way you might feel a bit more comfortable about giving your game out um, and at the same time you can entice people because hopefully they'll especially want more if you're only give, giving them like a little slice of that pie. Yep. Uh, what channels are you actually spending your marketing budget on these days? Not just time, but actually cash. All of them. Yay! <laughs> Uh, we're currently leading up to the launch of Sun the Skies right now and we keep um, switching around things on our budget. Uh, pool because we like there's just so many different things we still put a lot of money into advertisements just because making sure you know there are the most people at that top part of the funnel is really important to get you know the most wish list and then the most sales that we can um, but we're also you know have portions of our budget for creating content so whether that's with different influencers or having people stream our game we're doing things there um, we go to things like adventure X and res so we're spending money there um, I think like pretty much in every area we're probably spending money, community and social as well. So I understand, you know, a lot of smaller indies may not have that sort of budget to play around with. And it's certainly something even at Fail Better we kind of focus towards, you know, our upcoming game as opposed to games that are currently out or maybe getting put on different platforms. But it's such a crowded marketplace these days that doing anything that you possibly can is really important. So. I'm sorry I can't be very specific, but I would say pretty much any area.